All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's Beyond the Studio series. Thank you for joining us for today's um, topic, Revit, CAD, Scanning in the Professional World with our very own Steve Burton. This is the fourth in our seven part series called Beyond the Studio. I am Wendy Mueller. I work here in the training department at BRR and I will be moderating today's pres presentation. For years, the BRR team has worked with colleges and universities to support the next crop of talent as they venture into the field of architecture and design. While the pandemic has canceled a lot of our plans for office tours, mid-crits, and portfolio reviews, this webinar gives us another chance to connect with all of you and to offer our insights into working inside the architectural field. We are so excited today to have Steve Burton, one of our architects here at BRR. He's been with us for over 10 years, and he'll be discussing an overview, really, of professional architectural technologies. Before I hand it over to Steve, a few administrative details. If you have any questions today for Steve, please submit them using the chat function on the YouTube dialog box. I will be monitoring that today and we will address your questions um, at, the, at the end of today's webinar. We are recording this webinar, so if you have friends or colleagues who uh, were not able to join us today, please encourage them to check out the recording. It'll be here, right here at our YouTube channel. Finally, um, we hope you can join us for next week, the fifth in our seven part series. We'll be doing a webinar on construction documents. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Steve and get us started. Take it away, Steve. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Steve Burton, and today we'll be talking about the latest architectural technologies, specifically Revit, CAD, and scanning. And the focus is more pointing out some of the differences between how these things are used in the real world um, compared to what you might have been exposed to in an architectural educational environment. So a little bit about myself. I've been at BRR for over 10 years, but the second one is what I want to warn everyone about is that I've been teaching this information for the last five years. So admittedly, I get uh, pretty excited to talk about it, but hopefully I'll keep things uh, on the shorter side today. And uh, Wendy went over our, our housekeeping items already. So the, the topics we're gonna be looking at is first uh, going into CAD, then talking about uh, BIM, specifically Revit, and then scanning. So right off the bat, I think everyone's probably aware that CAD stands for Computer Aided Design, but what's a little bit different between how uh, AutoCAD specifically is used in the professional setting compared to school, is that I know that back when I was in school, I uh, would occasionally use CAD software just to get some good looking images where the focus was really just getting lines on the page. And that's um, substantially different than in the professional environment where the end goal is a complete set of construction documents. And one of the main ways that that differs is just right off the bat, the standards that are in place. So typically you'll either be following national standards or client standards, but this gets into the very uh, fine tuned specifics of how all of your layers are named, uh, how even your files and documents are named, all of the symbols and everything follows a very set pattern. And oftentimes if you're working for a larger client, they, they might even have client specific standards. And those are really used to further uh, capitalize on efficiencies and and uh, more client specific options that are that are involved. And when I'm talking about efficiencies, some of the pieces that go into it are uh, right off the bat the Lisp routines and scripts. These are some of the easiest ways that you can automate efficiencies within architectural models. And this is something that really is way more significant in the professional world as opposed to in your classes or studio settings. Because professionally, you wanna be able to do something not only as efficiently as possible, but especially something that can be repeated uh, on multiple projects. The kind of thing where if you spend an hour to uh, save yourself five minutes on every project in a matter of projects, that'll, uh, that'll pay for itself you know, time and time again. So being able to find any repeated 
tasks that you routinely do on every project and develop a way to do those faster and more consistent more consistently those are some of the real areas where uh, AutoCAD shines and some of the additional things that uh, that play into efficiencies is being able to customize the user interface and so a quick background story on me is when I first was learning AutoCAD my goal was to be better than my boss as fast as possible. And so I really dove in and tried to learn AutoCAD as thoroughly as possible. So not only did I try to learn all the commands, but then I tried to take it a step further and customize all my own uh, aliases for left-handed quick keys so I could keep my left hand on the, on the um, keyboard and my right hand on the mouse and go through everything as fast as possible. So I wouldn't even need to have buttons displayed so my drawing could take up as much screen as possible. And so every little thing that I could uh, add in, uh, I would try to do so just to be able to draft as efficiently as possible. But in the big picture, in terms of ensuring more office-wide consistency, consistency, another thing that factors in is the, the means and methods that you use to develop these drawings and to make sure that what you're seeing on that printed page is exactly what's expected. So for example, whereas if I was uh, back in college, if I drafted something and was ready to print it out, you know, I just immediately send that to the printer. And this might seem small, but in an office environment, you don't wanna just directly print out of AutoCAD. You first wanna print to a PDF or DWF, something where you can save a, um, a set capture of the moment in time for exactly when that specific sheet was issued. And then you would print from that. So that allows you to have multiple people review that digital PDF uh, and make sure that no one finds any errors and that the quality is as high as it can be uh, before that you print that off. But then later, if you need multiple copies or if you have to send them to, to different uh, locations, you're able to, uh, to have that record that you can go back and reference and print from. So overall, just at every opportunity, um, in a professional environment, you're very focused on doing things as efficiently as possible. Uh, so next I'm gonna talk about building information modeling. And this is something that I get very excited to talk about. Back when I was um, in class and in my studio classes, uh, I, I never really used Revit. I would use some other 3D modeling softwares like Rhino or Maya or uh, even SketchUp, but um, professionally, Revit is really the universal standard that everyone uses for construction documents because it has so many advantages. And one of those um, things that differs between if you've used Revit in class and if you're using it professionally is, again, just like AutoCAD, the way that standards come into play. Because, again, you, you'll often find that uh, clients might have client-specific standards, but above and beyond that, there's going to be additional ways that that factors into the contractual relationship between the owner that you're doing this work for and the firm that you're working for. And so there's even some some standard documents, like here I've got a screenshot of the AIA E203, where there's a standard document that um, outlines how digital models are shared on what frequency and who owns what. And it really gets a lot more in depth than just creating a model of a building. Uh, from that level. But one of the um, most interesting aspects of Revit that again goes above and beyond what you've probably seen in an educational setting is the multidimensional aspect to it. Because I think everyone's familiar with every 3D model has you know, a three-dimensional aspect to it. That's the Cartesian coordinates, your X, Y, and Z dimensions. But where Revit starts getting really interesting is, is as soon as you look beyond that, uh, at the fourth dimension of time. This allows you to model not only specific elements in specific locations in 3D, but also have those elements be in specific locations at specific times, whether it's existing conditions or conditions that are newly built in a phase one or phase two, you're able to really go above and beyond just that 3D model. And then all of your views of the project are taken at a point in, shine, at a point in time showing a specific uh, length back. So are you seeing just new construction? Are you seeing new and existing or new and demolished? You're able to build all of that into the, the model itself. Um, and taken past there is when 
I think the the dimensions start to get a little fuzzy, but uh, but it's touted as having even more dimensions to it, or at least more aspects, in that you can build in cost as the potential fifth dimension. So if you've built in the cost for all of the items in your model, you're now able to see at any portion of the building at any point in time, what is the economic cost of that work. So you're able to, to go above and beyond uh, what you'd expect, especially in a educational environment. And from there, you're even able to develop facilities maintenance and take it a step further and do energy calculations based on uh, what you have in your model and really fine tune the sustainability. And I find that all of these are things that uh, professionally are utilized a lot more than, than uh, educationally. Another really cool aspect that comes into play with um, building information modeling is all the options for visualization. So starting uh, on the left with this screen is that every program like Revit will have built-in visualization capabilities. Um, and so that's where you can get already a pretty good visualization, but it's right within the program. And from there, you can start building on that. So one of the things that, uh, that we had been exploring here at BRR uh, years ago even was the ability to export these models so you can wear them in things like the Google Cardboard or headsets that allow you to actually start getting a limited VR experience using a smartphone, which again, just takes it one step further and lets people uh, who aren't even in the program start to visualize the model. But once we're looking at these add-ins for Revit, like Enscape is, is my favorite and the one that we use here at the office, but there's others like Lumion you might be familiar with, but these allow you to have the enhanced visualization to get instant rendering abilities. So you have the lighting, you have reflections, you have materials, surfaces. And so this is something that you can do either within uh, the program or even export a standalone EXE file. But kind of the top of the line, in my opinion, in terms of the experience is being able to get into a fully immersive virtual reality or VR environment. So this is where you're able to put on the goggles and actually walk through these models. And so professionally, we have um, these VR stations at our offices, and we also have the mobile um, equipment to take to clients' offices because we find that once someone's actually in their model walking around and they can feel how many steps it takes to get from one area to another or how high a ceiling or an awning feels, that that's where you get that that next level of, of feedback about the model. And so another feature that um, that's really utilized in the professional world a lot more than in the educational environment is the scheduling ability. And so um, way back when I was first learning Revit, I was told that Revit was a portmant portmanteau or a combination of the words revise instantly. And that is really true throughout the whole model because any change that you make anywhere in the model takes effect everywhere in the model. And one of the most efficient ways that this is utilized is in scheduling, because as this little video clip here on the screen shows, as uh, equipment is added in 3D, that equipment is updated in the schedule. And as quantities are added, you see those quantities in real time uh, get updated. And this is fantastic because these schedules are really just a view of that building information model. And so if you think about the model as not necessarily just being a 3D object, but a database of information, your schedules are like live queries of this database where you can constantly just see what's in the model itself. And you can see what you have there uh, in any, any form that you wanna look at it. And so this is just another live view of that data and you can edit in the model and see your schedules updated or vice versa. So you can delete something in the schedule and it'll be removed in the model or you can update a parameter value and that, that takes effect. So this is something that's very powerful in the professional world where we have to produce a lot of schedules for all of our projects. Anything from a door and window schedule to something about procurement. Like if you need to put together build materials for a project, you're able to instantly get all of that information um, for whatever you put into it, you're able to schedule back out. Another main difference um, between the professional environment and the educational environment is the families that you can use. So 
for any of my students who have taken my Revit classes or really just anyone who's utilized Revit before, you've probably been able educationally to use any family you can find online. So whether it's um, something like where you go to a manufacturer's website and you download an exact item that you're looking for, or you go to something like revitcity.com and download things that have been uploaded by other users, you really have that, um, that open ability to use whatever you want in a um, school situation. But once you're in the real world, you're, you'll typically be developing and using a proprietary library. And that's for a handful of reasons, like what's listed here on the screen, is that you wanna make sure that the models that you're building have the right level of development or LOD. A lot of people think of this as the level of detail. And so I like to point out that if you were to, um, if you were gonna place a chair in a, a Revit model, for example, and you go to the manufacturer's website and you find you know that exact chair that you're looking for and you download it, it is almost guaranteed to not be quite what you want from a model standpoint because likely that chair has been over modeled to include every nut and bolt that comprises that, that actual object. And the file size is likely to be way too large. So by modeling whatever you're needing to, to use, by modeling it yourself, you're able to get the exact level of detail that you want in that family so that it looks correct in 3D, it looks correct on your page, uh, but it doesn't have any extraneous information to keep it as small as possible. And this also allows you to build in whatever options you need to have. So if you have a client that only utilizes two types of chairs in, in their office, for example, and you're modeling this office environment, you can have only those two options that you need in there that you can toggle between instead of having way more options that you don't need or fewer options than you need. And then lastly, you're able to specify all of the parameter values. So you're not gonna have extraneous parameters that are pointing to irrelevant information, but you're able to put in exactly what you need to not only have the families work the way you want, but to schedule all of the information uh, precisely the way that you want them. So this is something that seems pretty minor, but in hindsight, it's, it's very nice that as a student, you're able to use really whatever you want in your models, whereas professionally, a lot more goes into it. And then perhaps one of the biggest differences between the educational um, environment for utilizing Revit and the professional world is just the multidisciplinary nature of working in an office. So what we see on the screen right now is a, is a screenshot of a project I was working on that involved not only the architectural model um, that BRR was producing, but we also had our MEP consultants for the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing models. And those are being produced at that engineer's office and that model was linked into ours. And then there's also a structural engineer who had a separate model that was linked into ours. And so what we see on the screen was this retail project when I just turned off the visibility of the architectural model. So this is basically everything other than architectural model that, that actually goes into the building. And from an educational standpoint, if I was modeling, you know, an idea for a cool retail project, I might get to the point of putting in, you know, some columns and some lights, but rarely would, would someone get to the level of modeling every web and the joists or modeling every uh, ductwork and you know, return air supply. Like that's just uh, so much more above and beyond what we see in the educational world that is a major facet of the the professional world. But luckily with these softwares that we have in place, it allows for not only easy coordination and communication, but identifying any interferences or anything where I move a wall in the architectural model and now the structural engineer needs to move a column to correspond with it or anything like that. We're able to coordinate that all a lot more efficiently than, um, than in other programs like even AutoCAD or something. So lastly, we're gonna talk about scanning. And this is something that uh, is really fun to talk about because at BRR, we've been using uh, laser scanners for years now. And I uh, started getting involved with our program and helping to develop it a, a few years ago. And one of the great things about this is just the ability to capture an intense amount of data, especially information that would be very hard or if not impossible to capture through other means of architectural documentation. 
And so the goal, especially with uh, laser scanning in the architectural world, is to capture reality and to capture reality as precisely as possible to produce as-built models and drawings. And what I mean by that is if there's an existing building that we're going into, like maybe we're renovating it or just doing a remodel or an expansion, we want to be able to have as precise information about what's already there as possible. And so if that existing building is either um, very complex, that's one situation where we would really want to capitalize on getting a laser scan of the building, or if the building has a lot of fine-tuned information that we just need a extreme level of precision for modeling, um, all of this uh, would, would factor in in terms of the benefits that we'll get out of the laser scan. And so actually on BRR's blog, I don't know how many of you have been to BRR's website, but we have a blog feature and, and um, my colleague and I wrote a, a post about the top five considerations prior to laser scanning. So if anyone's interested to find out more information about that, we have a, a post on the website there. But in terms of the way that scanning works, um, there's a few different types. And so what you might think of as a more historical way of, of surveying would even be capturing topographical information, something that landscapers have been doing, you know, or civil engineers just capturing exactly what's there in regard to the earth around you. But what we're using primarily for architectural applications is the terrestrial scanning. And so this is where we have a mounted uh, scanner, usually on a tripod, and we're able to take that all over a building and capture all of these individual scans of exactly what's going on in that project, typically using LIDAR. Um, and that's really the best uh, solution right now in terms of very thoroughly and accurately capturing the existing information about a building. But where I think the industry is headed is what's called SLAM technology. Uh, and the, that's really a handheld scanner that captures information a lot faster. And that allows you to actually use that handheld scanner and walk around the building. And in real time, the scanner is capturing information about everything that's going on around it. Currently, there's uh, some limitations to it, both in terms of the precision that you get from that type of scanner, as well as the scope of how far can you scan all at once. Um, and that type of scanning requires you to kind of walk in complete closed loops over and over. And, and it's relatively new, um, but I think that that's definitely where the industry is gonna be headed uh, once you know, the prices come down and the abilities go up, which I'm sure will realistically be uh, right around the corner in terms of the big picture. But the way that the actual scanning process works uh, in terms of what we do today is we, um, we take our scanner on a tripod out to the site and before we go out to the site, we plan where we're going to scan because the scanner is able to capture um, only what it can see at any given um, point in the building. It can't see through anything. It can't see around corners. So we scan in the middle of spaces. We scan between spaces. If there's anything that's interesting, we'll try to get a lot of scans spread out around that area. But once we have all of the individual scans from a building, then that takes us to the next step where all that information gets sti stitched together through a registration process. And that's where, as you can see on this uh, image here, all of the individual scan locations um, get tied into each other. And so everything that each individual scan location can see, that matches up to what's seen in a neighboring scan location. And all of that becomes this real tight network of data that you know is a very um, accurate way to um, to turn individual points into a point cloud where everything is is in one big cohesive collection of points of information. And then lastly, what that allows us to do is bring that point cloud into um, a modeling program. So like a Revit or even an AutoCAD, and then you can start drafting or modeling on top of that. And so you're basically tracing uh, the information that's in the scan. So if you're looking at a plan view from above, you might see you know, millions of points potentially uh, along a real uh, wall in the building. So then you would model your wall in the program as a line of best fit along all of those data points to get something that's extremely accurate. 
And so a couple of considerations that, uh, that go into this is exactly how much information is needed. And what I mean by that is typically we've found that it's advantageous when doing a project like that is to take a very high quality information uh, model where you have way more points at a tighter spacing than you'd expect you need, because that allows you to really go in and model if you need to model some conduit going down a wall to get as precise as possible. However, the bigger your model and the more points you have, the slower it actually is to work with. So we'll take that high resolution model and we'll literally decimate it, like reduce the number of points by a factor of 10 to get a lot lighter of a model, something that's faster to work with. Uh, but at the same time, we can turn on that higher resolution model when we actually need to see that high level of detail. Um, and so again, here on the left is an example that shows kind of a high resolution model that we would use to model a building facade, as opposed to the right side where I took a very low resolution uh, scan of our studio just for fun to to uh, get a little studio portrait. So these are, are the members of our uh, our studio that uh, I was working with at the time when I did this here at BRR. So overall, that uh, that concludes everything that I wanted to talk about today in terms of uh, CAD, uh, building information modeling, BIM, and uh, laser scanning. So with that, I think we'll uh, switch over to uh, question and answer portion. Thank you so much, Steve. That was fast, a fascinating overview of some pretty cool technologies. Um, we do have one question right now. And just as a reminder, audience, you can submit questions right now using the chat feature on our YouTube channel. Uh, one question right now, Steve, which modeling programs do I need to learn? I know certain programs can interact with one another, so I didn't know if maybe Grasshopper or something like that would be worth learning in addition to Revit. Yeah, so that's a great question. And there's um, a couple of primary programs that we use in the office environment. And so I think AutoCAD and Revit, the two that I was talking about today, are the most commonly used um, programs specifically for producing construction documents. So with that as the end goal, those are, are the two primary programs that we use. But once we get into additional uh, programs like Grasshopper or anything for visualization, or like today I showed the Enscape add-in or Lumion, like all of those are definitely above and beyond that are great things to learn, especially when you think about the ways that those will enhance your portfolio if you're applying to jobs. Because I've found that um, oftentimes if my students are asking me like how to um, uh, how to learn new programs or how to put together good portfolios or how to showcase their work, I'll oftentimes recommend that, um, that you try to put together something that shows a diverse um, range of talents within that portfolio, as, as well as anything that shows kind of a high quality or anything that's uh, difficult or time consum consuming as a barrier to entry to show that if you've already mastered that, you're going to be one step ahead. Great. That's really good advice. I'm not showing any other questions at this time. Um, just a reminder, we um, really appreciate everyone's time today joining us for Revit. CAD and scanning in the professional world, how it's really done. Um, we hope that you can join us next week. Again, I'll just put a little plug in for that. It's going to be on the topic of building codes next Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We hope you can join us. And as always, please try to register on our event Right page so we can just get a handle on how many people are signed up and make sure we can send you up-to-date information and the correct link. Um, so thank you again for your time today and we hope you, we can see you next week.